I was going to let you finish. All right. <laughs> Standing on the front. And just, all right. Good to see you. All right. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please. One verse of scripture I want to read with you this evening, and then we'll look at some others as we go through this study tonight. Notice with me 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11, please. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11. And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you. Now, Father, add your blessing uh, to our study here this evening, and as we look into your word, Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Speak to our hearts tonight. And Holy Spirit, minister to each one of your people tonight as only you can. And help us tonight to understand what it means to be quiet. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, one of the major themes of First Thessalonians and Second uh, Thessalonians is the return of Christ. I want you to look in First Thessalonians with me, if you would, in chapter 1 and verse number 10. Notice where it says, To wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come, waiting for His Son from heaven. Notice chapter 2 and verse 19, how that chapter ends. What is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? Look at chapter 3, and how chapter 3 ends. Verse number 13. To the end that He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. We're familiar with chapter 4 and verses 13 through 18 about the Lord descending from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And so again, talking about the return of Christ. You look in chapter 5, look at verses 1 and 2. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And he talks again about the return of Christ. So it's all... Uh, uh, trying to help them understand and to grasp what's going to be happening when Christ returns and how should they live in the light of the fact Jesus is coming back? How should they live their lives? How should they conduct themselves? Should we sound an alarm? Should we beat a drum? Uh, should we uh, blow trumpets? Uh, what's, what, what's, what's the admonition? How is it that what we should conduct ourselves? You know what Paul says? Study to be quiet. Study to be quiet. Boy, that, that, that contradicts modern Christianity, doesn't it? Uh, uh, modern Christianity seems to me all about the entertainment and the excitement. Want the, the, the service needs to be entertaining and it needs to be exciting. And uh, if it isn't, then you didn't, you didn't succeed. And that's modern Christianity. It's kind of a thrill of the moment type thing. I kind of like amusement park Christianity. We want to live from one thrill to the next thrill. And we're trying to figure out what can be more thrilling. And, and it, it, it's, it's a peculiar admonition, isn't it? That, that you would think, boy, Jesus is going to come. The Lord's going to send from heaven. We're going to go to be with Him forever. Man, what, what are we supposed to do? Paul says, just be quiet. Just be quiet. That's amazing. You know, most, most, most colleges or uh, schools you go to, they have a class on public speaking. They teach people how to speak. I, I don't know of any college that I've ever seen a course offered how to be quiet. Huh? It's always on how to speak, how to talk. Every preacher has gone through pulpit speech, and maybe you went through college and you just had speech class. We live, not only that, we live in a very noisy society. Do we not? I mean, you think about it. You have the TV, you have the radio, you have your cell phone, you have your iPod, you have your iPad. Some people get up in the morning, turn the television on, and even though they don't watch it all day, it's on all day. They just want noise. And they leave it all day long and all night long until they go to bed. 
Maybe they leave it on when they go to bed. I don't know. But quietness is not a part of our society. I remember I was reading as I was studying for this message, and one, one particular man was talking about a certain group he was in at a seminar, and, and the leader of their group asked a question that he said nobody had the answer to. And that's all you heard right there. He said it just seemed like forever. And finally somebody said something and it was wrong, but at least it sparked a discussion and they used the rest of the time up talking. And afterwards he went to the instructor he said, why did you start with such a question that nobody could say anything and why did you let the silence go on for, it must have been five minutes. And the instructor said, I let the silence go for 30 seconds. But it seemed like five minutes to that guy. Because, you know, when you're not used to silence, silence for a short time seems like it's forever. It seems like it's a long time. And so we're very, very noisy. Not only that, we're a very active church. You, you have uh, Tuesday night, uh, the, the School of the Bible. You have Wednesday night church. Thursday night, we have folks go to the prison. Friday night, we have folks here at RU. Saturday morning, there's bus visitation and soul winning. And, and uh, Saturday morning out at London, 8.30, guys going out there for prison. Sometimes Saturday evening, there might be an activity or there's a teen activity or something going on. Or then Sunday, of course, there's Sunday school and bus route in the morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning. Uh, there's music practices, sometimes at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Choir practice at 5 o'clock, Christian growth class 5.30, evening service 6.30. And, and you get done with that, and guess what? You, you take a breath on Monday, and we do it all over again. See? That's a, that's a, and, and, and sometimes, you, and by the way, nothing wrong with any of those things. And then you throw in uh, conferences, or you throw in big days, and you throw out getting out flyers for two weeks, and you throw in a men's breakfast or a ladies' night out, and uh, all of a sudden, man, it's just, it's, it's busy. And, and people are, things are always happening, and that's okay. It's good to have things happening, amen? But listen, there's a flip side to that. And the flip side to that is quietness. Quietness. Study to be quiet. Now, let's, let's look at this. What does it mean to be quiet? Number one, being quiet means to listen. To listen. Psalm 4. Would you look at the fourth psalm with me? The book of Psalms, chapter 4. Notice the Bible says here, verse 4, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Here, God is saying, uh, by the way, awe, that's a good word, and stand in awe, uh, at, and, and, and be in awe of God. And, and then when it says, do you commune with your own heart upon your own bed and be still, Selah. Selah is like a, it's, it's, it's in the songbook, it's like a rest. Whenever you see the word Selah in the Psalms, it means Stop and think about what you just read. It's a rest. It's a musical rest. It's where you stop and you pause. And you just stop talking. You listen. When you commune with your own heart, when you're being still, you're stopping talking. It means be still. Because the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Why do you think so many people have a hard time grasping who God is? They never take time to be still, to stop talking, to stop the noise, and just listen. You see, we're, we're, we're so good at multitasking. 
How many of you, how many of you think you can, you're pretty good at doing more than one thing at a time? Hmm? Yeah. And sometimes, listen, that's, that's good in some areas, but listen, when you meet with God, you don't multitask. When you meet with God, when, when you commune with God, He wants you doing one thing. That's focusing and concentrating on Him. God wants, God wants your undivided attention. God wants your undivided attention. Quiet time, listen, quiet time with God doesn't hinder your work. It makes your work more effective. Like, oh, I, you know, it's, it, it, I, got, I got so much to do. I just got to, man, I got to get up in the morning. And I got to hit the ground running. And you're going to find out you're going to be running in mud. You're going to feel like you're behind all day. If you'll just take the time to be quiet with God, give God your undivided attention, and spend time with His Word, and you talk to Him and let Him talk to you, I'll guarantee you you'll be more effective in your day. You'll be more effective in getting things done. It will help you. Silence is good. Now, listen, it's awkward at first. You know why? We're not programmed that way. We're programmed for there to be noise. Some people, some people can't even sleep unless they have noise. Some people sleep with a fan, not for the air, for the noise. Because quiet drives them crazy. Now listen, God says quietness is good. Quietness is good. And you need to have time to be quiet. Silence is good. Part of the prayer time, part of time of talking with God is listening to God. Did you know, did you know when you pray, in fact, and, and this is really emphasized in the journaling that the uh, Reformers Unanimous put out. In your prayer time, they would have a request you pray for and things you praise the Lord for and uh, things you need to ask forgiveness for. But beside each one of those is a little word in parentheses. And those of you who have journals in RU, what's that little word in parentheses? Pause. P-A-U-S-E. Pause. In other words, when I, when I decide what do I need to pray for, what needs do I need, you know what I do? I don't just pull out my list and say, okay, God, here's my list. Here's what I need. da 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 No, it means I can get paper out and I can get a pen and I say, Lord, what do I need to pray for today? And then I wait and I'm quiet. I told that to one guy in prison one time. He said, I did that, but then all these things started coming in my mind. <laughs> That's what you write down. That's what you begin to pray for. If, if, if God tells me what I need to ask for, what do you think the chances are I'm going to get those prayers answered? After all, I'm not just praying for what I'm, I want or what I think I need. I'm praying for what he's telling me to ask for. Okay? But you don't get that if you don't listen. If your prayer isn't a dialogue, if your prayer is just a monologue, you telling God everything. See? You have to just be quiet. You have to just listen to what God wants to say. Pause. Learn to pause. You can't talk and listen at the same time. You can't talk and listen at the same time. If I'm always talking, I'm not listening. So take the time to listen to God. So being quiet means to listen. Means to listen. Number two, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Would you go there? Right after the book of... Proverbs is Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Being quiet, number 2 on your paper there, being quiet means to be patient. It means to be patient. Look at Ephesians or, uh, Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth, therefore let thy words be what? Few. 
Did you notice the word rash and hasty? Peter, Peter had a problem with being rash, didn't he? Hasty. Hey, hey, Lord, I know what you Let's build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Elijah, one. Huh. And then he heard a voice from heaven. Those other two guys, Elijah and Mo, disappeared, and it's just Jesus. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Huh. Sorry I said anything, Lord. Rash. Oh, uh, though, listen, though, though everybody forsake you, I'm not going to forsake you. Not me, Lord. How'd that work out? Boy, he was so rash, so hasty in his words. Look at Ecclesiastes 7. Ecclesiastes 7. Look at verse number 8 with me. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Here it talks about a patient spirit. But it's interesting. Did you notice the opposite of a patient spirit is a proud spirit? If I will not be quiet, maybe it's because I'm too proud. Proud people are loud people. Proud people are loud people. There's no secret. And, and I'm, I, I, I'm not being disrespectful, I hope. But I, I don't think it's a secret that the President of the United States is a proud man. And consequently, he is a loud man. Consequently, sometimes he's very rash with his words, very hasty with his words. There's a vice president, Mr. Pence, who professes his faith in Jesus Christ. And he exhibits that with what appears to be a very patient spirit. You don't, you don't see him, you don't, you don't see Mike Pence and say, boy, there's a loud mouth. No, you find yourself saying, I wish he'd talk more. I wish I could hear him say some more things. Okay? It's a contrast. What does the Bible say about pride? Only by pride comes contention. And pride goes along with an impatient spirit. How many of understand? How many understand? <coughs> Oftentimes, it takes more discipline not to say something than to say something. It takes a lot more discipline to not say something than to say something. Look at a couple verses in Proverbs. Go to your left from Ecclesiastes and go into the book of Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 17, verse 27 with me, will you? Proverbs 17 and verse number 27. Notice what the Bible says here in verse 27 of Proverbs 17. He that hath knowledge does what, church? Spareth his words. And a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. You have, when you have knowledge, you spare your words. When a man is talking, talking, you know, and by the way, you know what? A man who talks and talks and talks and talks, you know what? He's not listening. And if you don't listen, you never learn anything. So somebody who talks all the time is somebody who doesn't know very much because they never listen to learn anything. You have to be quiet to listen, and that's how you learn. So you have, you have, you have your knowledge, you spare your words. Look at chapter 29 of Proverbs. Chapter 29 of Proverbs and verse 20. Proverbs 29, verse 20. Notice this. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There's more hope of a fool than of him. Wow. All through Proverbs you'll find great admonition about holding it in. 
Don't. In fact, another place it says, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keeps it in till afterward. You see, it just you just don't well if I if I think it, I say it. That's just the way I am. Oh, don't say that. You're identifying yourself as being foolish. So yeah, that's not a sign of Christian discipline. J. Vernon McGee commenting on this verse said a lady went to a tongues meeting and the leader thought she was interested in speaking in tongues so he said madam would you like to speak in tongues and she says oh no she said I'd like to lose about 40 feet off the one I have now (laughs) study to be quiet what did James tell us that spiritual maturity starts with our tongue the ability to control that tongue allow God to put it under control all right so we say being quiet means to listen being quiet means to be patient being quiet means number three to wait on the Lord to wait on the Lord I'm going to say Isaiah 40 31 because you know it they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, I want you to look at the book of Ruth, chapter 3. Ruth, chapter 3. Joshua judges Ruth. If you get to 1 Samuel, come back. Right before there, all right? Ruth, chapter 3. Most of you know the story of Ruth. And she began to glean in the field of Boaz. And... He left her handfuls on purpose and such. And then, uh, I won't go into the whole story here. It's not pertaining to our study necessarily. But everything was uh, on the up and up and on the level and pure and all that. And uh, she laid at his feet one night. And, of course, he got in the morning and he gave her uh, a a big... (laughs) They they would take their skirt and and lift up, kind of make a big pouch. And he filled all that up with sheaves. And and when she came back to Naomi... uh, Verse 16, Ruth 3, it says, When she came to her mother-in-law, that's Ruth coming to Naomi, she said, this is Naomi speaking, Who art thou, my daughter? Well, who are you? What she's saying is, she's loaded down with all this, this stuff Boaz gave her. Who are you, my daughter? And then she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, next two words, what are they? Sit still, my daughter, till thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest till he have finished the thing this day. Naomi told Ruth to sit still. Sit still. What did he tell her to do? Let's just wait. Something's going to happen. Ever, you ever tell your children to sit still? Hmm? I mean, they get a little wild and they're running around and they're getting a little out of control and you just grab them and you say, you sit still. Hmm? You're going to calm them down. You're going to settle them down. And let me ask you a question. You ever think God does that to us? You ever think God would have to say that to his children? Hey, 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 sit still. Sit still a while. That's what I think you mean. Did you know sitting still is a mark of maturity? You saw the little wee ones sing tonight. What do they have a hard time doing? Standing still. All over the place. I don't see many of you doing that. Don't start. (laughs) Being still is a mark of maturity. Being able to wait is a mark of maturity. Being willing to wait on God is a mark of maturity. Saul, Saul didn't want to wait on Samuel. How'd that work out? 
Not very well. Got hasty, didn't he? Lost his kingdom. Now, you say, well, how does God tell us to sit still? Oh, he could bring sickness. So how, how many of you are just, it just about drives you crazy if when you get sick and you're bedridden for a day or two? I mean, that just about drives you, yeah. You say, man, I, I got to get out of here, man. I, I can't lay here. Hmm? Those are times, though, that God may be saying, be still. Be still. I got you flat on your back so you can only look up. Talk to me. Listen to me. Be still. Be still. Being quiet means to be still. And I know sometimes we'll, st we'll say, man, I don't like this. That's okay. God, God's probably looking at us saying, yeah, but you need this. No child likes to be told to sit still. Don't move. Man, nobody, no, no child says, good. No, they don't like it. But we know as mom and dad, they need it. That's what they need at that time. Now, understand something. When it comes to this being quiet, when it comes to being still, you, you can't compare yourself with each other. We're, we're all different. So some of you tonight, when I talk about this thing, about being still, some of you are thinking, ah, oh, yeah, man, that's where it's at. Because you like that. You like days like today when it's cloudy and misty and rainy and you just get a book and a blanket and on a couch and you say, man, this is the best thing in all the world. Leave me alone. Hmm? And others of you that's gloomy and dreary, you say, man, come on, where's the sun? We've got to get out and do something. You're, 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 you're just, you're, you're different. So you can't compare with each other. Okay? Don't. Don't compare your being able to be quiet with somebody else. Just compare you with you. What I mean by that is if you're able to be quiet, if you're able to just slow down a little bit, you may not be able to take, you may not be able to take 30 minutes and be quiet right off the bat because you're not used to being quiet at all. You better start, you better start building up to it. It's kind of like when you started praying. I mean, how many of the first time you heard somebody talk about praying an hour or a sweet hour of prayer, and you said, all right, man, I'm going to pray an hour. And you got on your knees, you started praying for everything, you prayed everything you knew to pray about, every missionary you ever heard of, and you looked at your watch, and you've been praying about seven minutes. Huh? You ever had that experience? And you thought, how do people pray for an hour? How does that happen? You know, and, and by the way, it happens when you don't just do a monologue for an hour, but you listen to God, too. It goes back and forth. And God begins to put things in your heart. And God begins to give you those things you pray for. God begins to search your heart and, and tell you things that you need to deal with in your life. That's all part of prayer, too. But you don't get that unless you're still. You have to be still before God. So don't compare yourself to others. Just compare yourself to you. See, quietness is not laziness. Quietness is not laziness. Quietness is not passive, it's active. That's why it says study, learn, pursue. Learn what it takes to be quiet. You're working on it. You're learning about it. You're, you're studying it so you can be quiet before God. All right? So being quiet means to listen. Being quiet means to be patient. Being quiet means to wait on the Lord. Number four. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 4. Are you okay? All right? Nobody's going to be quiet now. You can say amen, though. That's all right, okay? And you can say amen in church, amen? That's okay. Usually... Usually when there's a message and everybody's kind of quiet, I know that God's doing something. And people are being dealt with in their heart. Notice where we read tonight, 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. 
that she study to be quiet and to do, what's the next three words? Your own business. So being quiet means minding my own business. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Would you turn over there, please? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul deals with this again here. Look with me at verse 11. For we hear, 2 Thessalonians 3, 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Busybodies. A busybody, I looked it up. One who officiously, and then I had to look up officiously. I thought, man, I don't know what that means for sure. It means with excessive forwardness so somebody with excessive forwardness concerns himself with the affairs of others sticking their nose where it doesn't belong solving everybody else's problems and neglecting all of yours a busybody Warren Wearsby said this, Those who are about the Father's business do not have the time nor the desire to meddle in other people's business. Those who are about the Father's business do not have the time or the desire to meddle in other people's business. That's good. Now I want you to look, keep going to your right to 1 Peter chapter 4 1 Peter chapter 4 this you know God has a God has a real dim view of people who want to run other people's lives want to want to want to give can I help you with something don't give advice to people who have not asked you for it it's 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 nearly always resented and it's seldom ever followed. You've all been in that situation and someone just comes out of the blue and tells you, oh, I heard you talking and here's what you should do. And in your mind, even though you may not have said it, you, said, you thought, who asked you? Your opinion. Did I remember asking you what you thought? You see, there's just that resume. It, it doesn't work. Don't. Uh, there have been, I, I can't tell you, listen, I, I can't tell you the, the number of people that, that I, I'll, I'll hear somebody from somebody that they're going to do something, and by the way, make a wrong decision. I don't call them in my office and say, hey, you're, you're making a wrong decision. I've had people come in and say they're moving or they're doing this or they done, they're, they're going to do this. If they don't come in to say, Pastor, what do you think? Or, Pastor, we're considering this. What is your opinion? Or, what, what do you think we should do? If they just come in to make the announcement, I don't say anything. Because they're not coming in to ask my advice. They're coming in to make an announcement. And so, I don't give advice where it's not wanted. And, and you're wise if you don't. You, and by the way, that's okay. I'm not going to make myself a busybody in other people's matters. Don't do that. Look at 1 Peter 4. But let, verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. You think, well, uh, yeah, I, I meddle a little bit in people's lives, but that's no big deal, is it? Well, you're just in company with a murderer, a thief, an evildoer. Pretty bad company right there. Don't get caught up in that. 
How do you do that? You mind your own business. You work with your own hands. You get yourself busy doing something that, that, that you can do and that's constructive and it's helpful and you get busy in your work. And that will help keep your nose out of anybody else's work. Do your work, mind your own business. The enemy, the enemy to a quiet and peaceable life is wanting to fix everybody else's life. The enemy to a quiet and peaceable life is wanting to fix everybody else's life. The solution is, mind your own business and work hard. Work with your own hands. So you have need of nothing. You have lack of nothing. What are you supposed to do when you need something? Work for it. Work for it. Can I help you tonight? I'm not your enemy now. Don't get, don't get mad at me. I'm trying to help you. There may be time in your life, there may be certain occasions in your life when you may need some help from a social agency or government or a church, but no one ought to live off the government. That's our problem. Work. Work. Notice what he said in 2 Thessalonians. Go back to 2 Thessalonians again, would you please? I can tell this is real popular here. Second Thessalonians 3. We started in, in verse 11 about there's some walk disorderly. Notice verse 10 with me, would you? For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat? Wow. That's pretty, pretty tough, isn't it? Biblical principle. I think you ought to earn it. Listen, teach your children. This, this, starts, this starts with your children. Don't, don't, just, don't just give them. I, I don't believe in allowances. Okay, just because you're alive and you breathed all this week, you get this much money at the end of the week. What are we teaching them? I did nothing but breathe and do my thing, and I'm getting five bucks. Hey, this is pretty cool. No, 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 no. Here's your list of chores you do. You do your chores each day. You mark them on the list. At the end of the week, here's what you earn. I want, I'd really like to get one of these. Okay, here's how much it costs. Let's see how, how, my, how long it's going to take you to... Earn that. Save up your money so you can buy that. And then when they want to get, when you're in the store and they say, oh, I want to get this candy bar. Oh, I want to get this. You're going to say, now, remember, you're supposed to save for what you wanted, remember? And they're learning that they'll have to say no to some things and hold on to their money so they can get what they want. You see, we've, we've lost that. In our society, and now, and now those kids that have gotten everything they wanted and had everything handed to them, they they've grown up, and they want the government to give me this, pay for my college, pay for my phone, pay for pay for everything. Hmm? I don't want to I don't want to get health insurance. I'm gonna I'm gonna save my mom and dad's health insurance till I'm 26. Don't get me started on that. Right. But work hard. Work hard. Mind your own business and work hard. Quietly work for what you need. Priorities. Priorities. Now, one more verse and we'll be done. Got to get you going anyway. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. We would have been done, but Brother Parrish took so long with that testimony. <laughs> 1 Peter 3. Now, this passage is talking about wives who are trying to win a husband that is not saved. And he talks about how they can be won by how the, the, the behavior of the wife, that's what the conversation means here. 
And it says in verse 3, who's adorning, talking about adorning of the wife, let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of the hair, the wearing of gold, the putting on of apparel. Notice, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Notice, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, if I understand this passage correctly, that, that quiet spirit, that meek and quiet spirit, that, that hidden man of the heart, isn't just something the woman has. The man has that too. I believe it's a reference to the Spirit of God dwelling in us. Now listen, we're all to cultivate that meek and a quiet spirit inside of us. And God says, in His sight, that's a great price. I know. We look at the person who can stand up and preach, and we say, man, there's a... Or the person stand up and sing. Wow, look at... Somebody plays the piano and does... Oh, man, listen to that. You know what God does? God looks in the congregation for those with a meek and quiet spirit. And he says, that's what I value. That's what it means to great price. It means to place a great value upon. To place great importance on. That's what God places the greatest importance on. Is that meek and quiet spirit. If that's the case, then why don't all of us determine that we'll study to be quiet? Amen? Let's stand together for a word of prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for the plainness of your word tonight. Thank you for the admonition that Paul gave us here in Thessalonians about being quiet. And really, Lord, it's all through Scripture. Father, forgive us sometimes for how noisy we become. We continue to always seem to be talking or having something on or and, and as soon as we get in the car we turn on a radio as soon as we get home we turn something on Lord forgive us for our lack of quietness and Lord while we're busy and we want to be serving the master and we want to be busy about our father's business we certainly don't want to neglect the quiet life taking time and a quiet time with you every single day. And I pray, Lord, that each one of us tonight would purpose in our heart that we'll take time each day to be quiet with you. For in your sight, that's a great price. That's of great value. Lord, I pray your blessing would be upon us for our desire to want to be alone and quiet with you. Lord, may others see that quiet spirit. And I pray they'll give you the glory for it. Now, Father, dismiss us with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's sing it one more time, all right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my...